So you're welcome to the fourth of the distinguished speaker uh, lectures uh, for this year, uh, sponsored by the Center for Innovation and Computing at Lausanne. Um, we have one more coming. Uh, the speaker uh, will be on May 16th, uh, dealing with security issues. Uh, so I'm um, looking forward to having uh, the whole set of five talks this year completed, and welcome all to join us there. I'm thrilled to have uh, a fantastic speaker today, uh, dealing with a very, very uh, current and topical kinds of, uh, of issues, uh, Professor Giuseppe Di Giacomo. And I will now pass this over to Professor Yves Lesbron, who will uh, introduce her. Okay, so uh, Professor Di Giacomo is a co-professor in computer engineering at the Sapienza University in Rome. Uh, so uh, he's done very influential work in many areas of uh, computer science and, and artificial intelligence, uh, particularly on description logic, uh, which contributed to uh, the birth of the uh, web ontology language, OWL, and, uh, which is important in the semantic web also, uh, they've done some uh, original work in the idea of ontology-based data access, where you combine some semantic knowledge with uh, uh, databases. Uh, then uh, he's done uh, important work in reasoning about action in AI and uh, defining uh, one of the, the main uh, high-level robot programming languages called Congolog. Uh, he's also devised one of the, the most well-known uh, approaches to service composition uh, called the Roman model. And this was awarded uh, the uh, uh, most influential paper of the decade at the conference uh, ICSOT uh, 2013. Uh, he's uh, on the editorial board of many of the top journals uh, in uh, AI, uh, uh, including artificial intelligence. He was on the board of Chair before, and he's on uh, the editorial board of Accent Chromatica. And he's also a, a fellow of AAA, uh, Euro AI, European AI uh, uh, Association, and also an ATM fellow. So, I'm very happy to introduce him, and he's going to talk about the AI Foundation for Data Aware Business Process. Thank you very much. Hi. So thank you very much for inviting me, and uh, I hope this uh, talk uh, will be accessible enough. I'm not that sure, actually. I just learned there are some high school kids here. Let's see. Let's see how it goes. If you have any question at any moment, please stop me and ask. Okay? No, I, I don't care. I can uh, continue with it. Okay. So, what I'm going to talk, I'm going to talk about data and process. Okay, so now data and process are the two ingredients of any kind of computation. Data and process. So data is the information we manipulate. Process is how we manipulate this information. Okay, every program you write is about these two things. But the idea here is to actually understand this data and this process without thinking of a specific problem, but thinking at the conceptual level. So we want to look at the data in a, a more abstract way, without considering the detail of the particular data structure we're going to use in a computer in order to deal with it. And the same thing for process. And in fact, we can even consider processes that have nothing to do with computers. Okay, so maybe the process uh, for uh, getting the driving license. Okay, so very different from a computer process, but still, these are things that require manipulation of information and information of its uh, uh, data. Now, what's interesting about this is that we have very good tools to represent conceptually these two things. So, for example, I'm here using I'm here using UML class diagram 
This is the essentially main formalism used in software engineering to talk about data. And for example, you can really understand how easy it is, even if you don't know anything about it, because you can read it. Okay, for example, this thing says there are employees, okay, they work, they work on projects, and this project requires expenses. And then there are some employees, there are temporary employees, okay? And also you you can also learn about, uh, so there is written here, important thing, for, for example, say every employee has to work at least in one project, otherwise no, it wouldn't be here. And the expenses are all expenses for a very single project, a very specific project, okay? And, uh, and uh, there, are, there are several formalisms for doing this, this is one of them, there are others. And uh, even uh, even a pretty advanced one like this one, I'm going to talk about them later. And uh, notice, however, that when we write this, we are really looking at a picture. So we are looking at something static, okay? Which we now reason, okay, there are employees, they work for project, expenses, expenses belong to project, whatever. But we don't really know what is the process that we are going to execute over this. Uh, uh, data. So we don't know how data evolves. On the other hand, there are also very well-known formalism for representing business, uh, for representing processes, actually business processes. So business processes is a, um, a community working on exactly representing at the abstract level, at the conceptual level, processes. And let me read this process for you. Okay, so we start from here, we ask the user to select a certain project, and then the project, it acquires some date, okay, and then it computes the cost of the project within the date, the date acquired here. Now, at the same time, so parallelly, okay, concurrently, we calculate something, it's called a ratio, I don't know what that is for now, and then when these two activities are finished, we produce a report, and then we decide if to continue or not. If we continue, then we select another project, we do the same thing again for the new project, otherwise we just exit and the process finishes. So this is, this particular formalism is called BPMA, and is probably the most used formalism nowadays to represent processes at the conceptual level. However, notice that although it talks about expenses, calculating the cost, acquiring dates, etc. So it talks about data. It doesn't really say anything about the data it's working with. Okay? Now, this is not by chance. So actually, this is considered a big problem in this community. Essentially, the people working on data belong to a certain silos, and the people working on processes belong to another silo. And they use methodologies, tools, techniques, formalism, completely different. And although they are all representing things conceptually, okay, so in, in the abstract, without considering specific programs, they are really not talking to each other. And this is recognized as a big problem. So look at this. So in this study, they actually verify that in 83% of the cases, the two silos didn't talk. Okay, so they, they went uh, over the, the entire process without talking. Now, obviously, there is a moment in which they need to talk. And the moment is when you actually implement things. When you implement things, there's nothing to do. You need to have data and process, because the process without the data cannot be executed and the data without the process are useless. So there is a moment in which these two things come together. But unfortunately, this moment is not, the, uh, um, is not at the conceptual level. It's a very uh, successive moment in which you are already way uh, uh, into the development of your application. Okay. And, uh, uh, so there is a group of people, a group of scientists that is saying this is a problem. We should 
actually do something about this. We should integrate these two silos, put them together. Okay, and there are very influential papers about this. Look at this. Process and data are just two sides of the same coin. Okay, and uh, uh, explicit or representation of data in business process is crucial. So we really need it. Okay, so there are people saying this. And indeed, there is a group of scientists that is working on this. And uh, uh, actually, is working on this relatively recently. So it's from the 2000s. With an approach that they call holistic. Okay, the approach is called artifact centric approach. And uh, it originates from certain problems they had at IBM, where these two silos need to communicate, but actually they want to communicate earlier than uh, uh, at the implementation level somehow. And uh, there has been a, a, a lot, a steady line of research working on this in the business model community since the 2000s. And uh, a, a very important step was done during a European project. Okay, this European project AXI, okay, Artifact Safety Service Interoperation, in which people started looking at the possibility of analyzing data and process together. Okay, analyzing formally, so formal verification, talking about formal verification. Okay, so what's the idea? The idea is that we have an information model, we have a process, we want to put them together and to consider an, an holistic view of the, of, of the system. Okay? So, in our case, it would be something like this. On the one hand, we had our UML class diagram describing the data. Okay? Then we have our process, the BPM diagram, describing the process. And then we have also some glues, this correspond essentially to process variables, okay, that would connect somehow the data over here with the data over here. And for example, I don't know, when here they select project, here project, this project is actually an instance of this class. Okay, so you can actually extract it from here. And then uh, uh, this is how uh, you can see it as a single thing. <laughs> the, the idea is to have so a conceptual model which is actually executable. So you can actually execute it. Okay, it's not going to be very efficient, okay, but you can actually execute it if you want. Because there are all the details. Okay, here it is the description on how so what all the activities actually do. And uh, uh, what we have, we have a state at every instant of time, okay, a state of a data aware process is a state in which which corresponds to an instantiation of a UML class diagram, an instantiation of the variables in the artifact, and a position of the control flow, actually, there can be more than one control flow because there is concurrency in the BPM diagram. And using uh, uh, this state, we can actually build a big tree representing, actually, it's an infinite tree possibly infinite branching and infinitely uh, with infinitely long run, okay, infinitely long execution. Okay, they describe formally this process. Obviously an infinite tree is not a it's a nice mathematical object but obviously nothing that corresponds to something concrete. Okay, maybe we can really end all this kind of things. Okay, so that's what we want to analyze. We want essentially to analyze this big infinite trees. Not only execute it, but also analyze it. Now, analysis. What about analysis? So there is a lot of work in data-related analysis. Okay, so in analyzing the data. So this is actually the most important activities of database theory: intentional reasoning over queries, containment equivalence, study of database dependencies and uh, also semantic conceptual model, relationship with uh, uh, more concrete models, uh, and also reasoning over views, uh, many important uh, problems that is to deal with analysis, and also many important results, so we know how to do this very well. What about process analysis? Okay, also process analysis will be applicable 
okay, especially in the last uh, 20 years, okay, maybe 15 years, we've been particularly good at that. And uh, so the breakthrough has been making some technique called model checking working for real. And uh, uh, this has happened essentially since mid-90s. So since mid-90s, this uh, uh, um, model checking was working, it started working very well. And uh, 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 so we can analyze and verify that properties have set that uh, system has certain properties of interest, typically expressed in temporal terms using specific logic like uh, uh, linear time logic, which uh, uh, you have only one future, one real future, or branching time logic, in which in front of you you have several futures. Okay, and uh, of various difficulties, including. This one, Mukaku, which is which has been considered essentially the most expressive logic in this area. Okay, it's a little bit a low level, so you normally don't write expression in this uh, in, in this language, but uh, you write, uh, uh, but you often just uh, translate uh, your formula into this language to do the actual computation. And uh, uh, your system, uh, so this is how you formulate the properties. How you formulate the system, how you describe the system, you describe the system with this transition system, these are these infinite trees that I showed you, that actually can also be essentially finite or finite graphs. And uh, uh, temporal logic, these, these formulas are evaluated by this transition system. We have a spectacular result of this, but only if the transition system is finite. So it is considered crucial for model checking technology to a transition system to analyze this file. And essentially what the, the, the model checking does will essentially uh, um, scan all possible state of the transition system to be sure that all the properties of the interest are actually satisfied. Now, <coughs> when we look at, the, oh sorry, before we say that, I want to say also this. Notice that in BPM, the BPM community, the community of business process, also this analysis and verification is considered one of the most crucial questions. Okay, one of the most influential topics of the area. The problem, however, is that if you have data and process, you cannot represent the state of the system with a final number of propositions, final number of simple properties that holds together. You need to go to a model where states are represented relationally, they are represented in logic, essentially, as logical models. Okay? And uh, the result that your system becomes infinite, typically infinite branching, and uh, obviously also infinite with long uh, uh, execution, and uh, the query language that you need to use to do this analysis, they need to deal on the one end with the temporal dimension, like LTL, Lukaku, CTL, that I mentioned before, but also with the first order dimension, like SQL, okay, or like some uh, important, uh, uh, nice way to represent, uh, uh, to, to, to query data uh, in this relational structure. So essentially what we need, we need is some sort of first order variant of temporal logic, where the first order is that we are representing the state in first order. Okay. Unfortunately, if you have a first order uh, description of the state, a relational description of the state, it's immediate to get undecidability. So the impossibility actually to do the analysis. Undecidability means it's impossible to do. And why? Well, there is this famous guy, Turing, that invented this Turing machine. Okay, this Turing machine were very simple computers, and uh, these computers were, were like this. They essentially had a tape, okay, which was, uh, in which you could write single characters. And uh, this tape was unbounded, so you can put as many information as you want in this tape. And then there was a finite transition system, a finite logic, okay, finite state program working with this state. 
However, the two things together, okay, actually become very, very powerful. They are actually able to simulate any kind of uh, computer program. And uh, even deciding simply that the program will eventually terminate is undecidable. Now, how you handle this with a relational state? Very easy. You take one relation to represent the tape, and now you start tape and positioning the tape, and now you start putting data in this relation. And if the relation goes unboundedly, then you have a tape that goes unboundedly, and then you can simulate to the machine. So, we know that when we want to analyze this kind of process, we need to have some restriction. We cannot analyze all of them. We need to have some interesting, nice restriction. Otherwise, nothing can be done. And there's been several group of uh, scientists in the world working on, on this uh, in, the, in the last 10 years, okay? And uh, very many results, very fresh results come out. And in particular, I'm going to talk about one particular approach that's been followed by all and with uh, uh, Eve of York University, okay? Eve Lesperanza. And uh, this is what I'm going to talk about next. So, the idea of uh, these two groups was to use a very standard AI <coughs> formalism for representing business process and uh, 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 with data. Situation calculus. Now, what is situation calculus about? So, situation calculus is uh, the outcome of an important idea that we have uh, in AI. The idea of uh, a, um, having a sort of explicit representation of knowledge and manipulate this representation of knowledge. And uh, the idea is to use essentially symbols to represent the knowledge and uh, reasoning procedures over the symbols to extract from the knowledge you have new knowledge. Okay, so you, for example, say uh, John uh, works, uh, John is a temporary employee, okay? And then since John is a temporary employee, he's also an employee. And if he is an employee, he has to work in one project. So you know that John works in one project, for sure, okay? And even if he's not represented anywhere, but you can use the representation plus the reasoning to understand. And uh, the, the idea of the knowledge representation community is not only to represent and reason about these things, but to represent and reason to influence how the system acts. In particular, this is artificial intelligence, how an autonomous system acts. So we take his decision on what to do next on the basis of his knowledge and his ability of reason. Okay? Plus, obviously, many other things, but including this. So, uh, knowledge representation, we use logic to represent the symbols and to do reason. We use logic. And logic has been used as a formal system for uh, uh, thousands of years. Okay? And there is a very long history. At a certain point in the in the beginning of the 19th century, there was a connection between uh, logic and computation. Okay? And logic was used to represent nicely computation. However, the idea there was not to represent knowledge, was to represent the formal structure that we had to deal with, to represent mathematics essentially. Instead, only very lately, somehow, in historical terms. So, so John McCarthy actually had this very strange idea, somehow, to say, no, we're going to use logic, okay? We don't have to say which logic, in particular, but in general, logic, so the ability of representing symbols in tourism, to represent what humans know, and use reasoning to make this artificial intelligence agent act. Okay, so it's a, it's, a, it's a pretty recent idea, and uh, actually there is a, um, 
a very nice book that has just came out uh, by written by Hector Lebeck talking about these things. Very interesting. And also it says a little bit the history of this stuff. Okay, so let me go back to situation calculus. So situation calculus was actually developed by the same guy who had this idea, McCarthy, okay, in 63, to talk about programs then. Okay, programs with common sense if you to say. And uh, the idea of a uh, situation calculus is the following. So we use first of the logic to represent the state. Okay? And uh, the state is represented through situation. Uh, we have to be a little bit clear of what the state is. A state is where the system has arrived okay, since it started its execution. Okay, then the certain property will be true in the current state. So sometimes we say also that they correspond to histories instead of state. And uh, we have objects, and objects have several properties in the value state, and we have action to move from one state to the next state, okay, to one situation and to the next situation. The properties of objects are called fluid, and essentially we use two logical axioms to progress this system, to understand how this system executes. So on the one hand, we have precondition action that tells you when you can do a certain action. And on the other hand, you have successor state action that tells you what is the effect of executing an action. Okay, so for example, this thing says, if I'm executing A in situation S, okay, the fluid death will be true if this condition is already true, so it becomes true, or if it was already true and the condition that falsified didn't become true. So the key result of this situation calculus is in a, a technique that is called regression. Essentially, the possibility of computing the weakest precondition, what we call the weakest precondition in software engineering. So, you give me a state of the system, and I can, you give me the sequence of action being executed so far, and I can regress every formula, every property that is true at the end of this sequence, to some property that is true at the beginning of the sequence. So essentially, I can reduce reasoning on the future okay, through a certain procedure to reasoning on something that is true now. Okay, I check something to now and use that for understanding what is going to happen in the future. And this is the computation of the weakest precondition in the science. It's also known. But typically, we, get, we know how to compute weakest precondition only in very special cases. And situation calculus is one special case in which it is possible. The problem, however, is that uh, there are certain properties for which this regression is not useful. And this property, our property talks about something that happens in time. So let me show you some. For example, in all future possible state, a certain property is true. Okay? In all future states, okay, my nuclear reactor will not explode. Okay? It's a very good property to have and it's a good property to check. Okay? Eventually, whatever action I do, a certain property will be true. So it's a, even, there's nothing I can do about it. At a certain point, a certain property will be true. Okay? Sooner or later, I'm going to die. Okay? It's true. There's nothing we can do about it. Okay? It is always true that if you ask me something, okay, eventually, so I'm going to answer you. Okay? So maybe not immediately because maybe I'm doing something else, but if you ask me a question, sooner or later, I'm going to answer you. Okay? This is also a very important problem, a very important requirement in systems. Okay, to be sure that they are responsive. And, uh, okay, so these are, these are typical temporal property we might be interested in. This is the realm of uh, verification. And verification, model checking, works for finite 
number of states. So we, if we somehow have a finite number of states, or we have a bound, uh, we have a, a fixed number of objects we are interested in, so we can essentially go from first order logic to propositional logic to represent the state, we know how to do it. Otherwise, we are a little bit lost in the sense lost in the sense that we have only approximate techniques. But there is one important case that came up um, essentially five years ago, okay, where we can indeed do much more than this. And this is the case which we call bounded situation of calculus action. There is a little bit of mathematics in this line, I'm sorry. There's nothing to do. Okay. So, the first thing to observe is that writing that a certain fluent, okay, a certain property, is, contains only a finite number of tuples, a fixed number of tuples, a bounded number of tuples, okay, I can write it in this way, it's expressible in the total logic. Okay, so I can write a first order logic formula saying, look, there, there are not going to be more than uh, 10 projects okay, during my life. Okay, project can change over time, but at most 10, I can write it in this way. And then I can, I can say that for a fluid is bounded if this formula holds. And then I can say the situation is bounded if all fluids in that situation satisfy this formula. And then I can say that the entire action theory is bounded if I'm guaranteed that whatever action I do, in any case, I'm going to satisfy this formula for all fluids. Okay? Let me give you a concrete example. Okay, so this is a sort of prototypical example of bounded state. It's a bookshelf. Okay? Suppose you are a avid reader, so you like to read a lot. Okay? For example, my daughter reads at least one book a week. Okay? It's crazy. So how, how can I handle that? Well, she has only one bookshelf. So if she wants to buy a new book, she has to go in her bookshelf and say, I'm going to throw out this other book. So as to make space in the bookshelf for the books that she uses. Okay? So the idea is exactly this. You can use any property you like. However, your property will have only a certain number of slots. Okay? Only a certain number of books. Okay? You can change books over time. Okay? She reads continuously new books, okay? but throws away old books. So she's not accumulating an infinite amount of books in her room. Okay? Because after a while, the bookshelf terminates and uh, uh, becomes, uh, becomes full, and she cannot buy a new book until she throws away another one. So, if you are in a situation like this, we say that you are state bounded. Okay? State bounded. And uh, there are syntactic conditions to check for this state bounded, and it's also possible to check that if the initial state of your theory is bounded, actually the theory preserves this boundedness. Okay, so if I say, look, in my initial state there are at most 10 books, I can check if whatever I do, there will be at most 10 books in my bookshelf, whatever I do. Okay, now I need to go technical. Okay, so, Actually, I want to understand what is the mathematical structure that is behind this idea of situation calculus and bound the situation calculus in particular. And uh, as I told you, when we analyze dynamic systems, we use transition systems. And here we have transition systems with data, with relational state. So I do a transition system, and my transition system is of this form. Okay? This is my transition system. I have a finite number of, of fluids, some constants, and then I have a domain of object, possibly infinite, actually typically infinite. Okay, for example, all the possible uh, strings. Okay, and uh, I have a set of states, possibly infinite, 
Okay? One initial state, let's say just one for convenience. Okay? Then I have a transition relation that tells me how I move by doing essentially action from one state to the next state. And to each state, I have associated to each state a full first order interpretation. Okay? Without functional symbols, technically. Okay? Only with relation. These are relational states. In particular, if you get a situation calculus action theory and you look at the model of the situation calculus action theory, you can extract from the model the corresponding transition system. And this is called the induced transition system of uh, the uh, model of the situation calculus action theory. And essentially, it's essentially the same shape as the others. Now, there is one interesting case of transition system. And this interesting case is when transition systems are generic. What it means, generic? It's a notion that comes from databases. Essentially, it says that everything we need to know about the first order theory that talks about a certain state, okay, is included. What it means? It means that, uh, sorry, It means that if two states are isomorphic, so there is a bijection between the two, then if one can do a certain transition, the other also can do the same transition and get to a state that are still in the same isomorphism. Okay, this is what it means. It means essentially that uh, um, uh, we don't have uh, a special information in the object that we are considering because we can rename object apart we can rename object without having any consequence in the theory okay? by the way this is completely typical in first order logic this is always the case when you write a theory in first order logic and it's also the case when you write a theory in situation calculus and actually it is the case in essentially all formalism that have been proposed for uh, handling uh, uh, reasoning about action in AI. Okay? Also noted that there is some Markovian flavor because we are deciding the transition on the base of the current state, okay? in particular of the uh, model associated to the current state, of the formation in the model associated to the current state. Okay. Now, let's consider a verification logic. In particular, I'm going to consider directly the most difficult one, Mukakos. Okay, so Mukakos is uh, a very famous logic because it's essentially more expressive at the propositional level than all other logic proposed for verification, including PDL, CTL, LTL, LTL star, etc. And uh, it has been used in uh, the context of situation calculus already since uh, 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 already uh, in several papers. Essentially, the logic works like this. You have properties of the current states. Okay? And then you have end, or, etc., etc., for position Then you have the possibility of talking from the current state about what is going to happen at the next step. And you can talk about that saying there exists a next state where phi holds, or saying that in all next states phi holds, okay? Because it's a branching time logic, okay? And this is the operator. So one, there exists a, a next state where phi holds, and this one is for all next state phi holds. And then there is this operator over here that allows to express arbitrary inductive and co-inductive definition over this logic, over this, this fragment of the logic. Um, and for example, I can express there exists a possible future state, okay, such that A holds, with this little formula over here. Either A, so this formula over here says either alpha is true now, or there exists a way of moving such that the same thing holds again. Okay, and what it means the same thing holds again? Either alpha is true now, or there exists a way 
okay, to move so that the same thing goes again, and so on and so forth. Okay, except that this is a point, and so this stands for a point that says you cannot continue forever going to the right. Sooner or later, you need to go to alpha. Okay, so it's an inductive definition. This one, and so it says eventually alpha is going to be true in one part. And uh, if I want to say that alpha is going to be true forever, okay, in every path, I can find this little formula over here. And if I want to say that it's going to be true, whatever action I do, whatever decision I make, this is the formula corresponding to it. And if I want to say that every time alpha is true, eventually beta is true, this is the little formula I have to buy. And so I can buy formula representing all the formulas. For example, Look at this. All robots are always located in the safe area. For every robot in every location, okay, the location in the safe is in the safe area. Now this happens now, and I'm using the fixed point operator in particular, I'm using this one, to say that I'm going to move this all around my transition system. So this is going to be true everywhere. Okay, so I'm saying that. Uh, Forever robots are going to remain in their nice position. Okay, now in this in the logic that I just shown, actually there's not the possibility of quantifying across situation. Let me give you an example. All the students, all X that are students, wait now. Okay, so I'm collecting all of you, okay, which are students, and I say eventually they're going to be graduated. Okay? So this student, the very student that are in this room, eventually in the future they're going to be graduated. So in order to say this, I need quantification across situation. Because I'm taking the student now and I'm talking about them in the future. Okay? So this was proposed a long time ago. A long time ago, in, in 97, but then we didn't have any example. See, we didn't know how to compute this. Okay? So we know that we could write it, but we didn't, we didn't know how to do it. And uh, in particular, then we used directly second order logic in order to talk about the fixed points. Okay? And this is how you write it. Notice that these are simple formula in second order logic, but this is second order logic, very difficult to logic per se. Um, but you can have also a set theoretic uh, semantics that is more similar to what you have in the propositional case. This is the semantics in particular from this logic. Anyway. And in particular, just for the notion, for those that know about it, so the particular formula that we see over here, okay, these are the task and master definition of this point and greatest this point that are embedded in the logic directly. Okay. In the end, I'm going to show that this new way for bounded action theories is actually designed, which is a very surprising result. In order to do that, however, I need some deter. So the first thing I need to talk about is by simulation. So I hope that uh, all the students in computer science know about by simulation. If they don't know, this is the most important thing to do after this talk. Okay? So look up this notion by simulation, which is extremely interesting. Okay? This is a crucial notion to understand concurrency. It was introduced only in 1971. It's a co-inductive notion, not an inductive notion. And in particular, now I'm going to show you the by simulation needed in order to talk about the kind of transition system we are talking about in this talk. And what we have is the following. We say that uh, two states of two transition systems are in a by simulation relation here if, first of all, Q1 is isomorphic to Q2. Okay, according to a certain bijection. It's isomorphic to Q2. And however Q1 moves, Q2 can copy and remain 
in the same relation, the same by simulation relation. So it can continue to do the copying up, uh, uh, even after having done this step. So I can copy, okay, in EVA actually can copy me here, okay, now, because we are identical, okay, and then if I move, it can copy me, it can do the same move as me, okay, and then we remain identical. And if it moves, okay, I can copy him, and so we remain identical. The problem, however, is that in order to set this up for the first order case, we need to decide once and for all a bijection between the domain of the two transition systems, which are infinite. In this bijection, so it's an infinite object. Okay, it's an infinite mathematical object. So this is a very nice definition, okay, but it's not going to lead us to any desirability result because we cannot really simplify the system. Okay? It's not possible that Eve is simpler than me or me simpler than Eve because in the end we need to have the same object. So we have this, essentially the same complexity with respect to the data, the same difficulties in dealing with the data. Okay? And what is interesting, however, is that uh, this uh, uh, transition system, okay, two transition systems that are bisimilar, they satisfy exactly the same Mukaku's formula, the same temporal logic formula. Okay, so I cannot use this by simulation to get anything concrete, but I can use another one. Okay, I can use another one. And this other one, it's called persistence preserving by simulation. And look what it does. So first of all, instead of saying that uh, me and it need to be identical in the absolute, it says you need to be identical only on the things that are explicitly written now. Okay? So in the extension of the fluid now. Okay? We don't care about all the other objects. For the other objects, we don't care. Okay? So if in my domain there is John, Okay, in his domain also there must be a John. Okay, but if in my domain Ellen is not present, well, I don't care about Ellen in his domain. Okay. So this is the first step. The second step is that now when we do the copy game, okay, I do my move. Okay, you need to copy. Okay, and now we need to get to a new state. And what we want of this state? When we want this isomorphism to be an extension of the old one, but also a restriction of the old one. Essentially, what we want to preserve are only the objects that I've seen in the last state, but I don't care about the things that I saw two states ago. Okay? So if an object exits from my uh, active domain, okay, like in Java, if I reuse a certain, uh, a, a certain uh, uh, address, okay, the object identifier corresponding to this address, the object identifier essentially can be recycled. So if they disappear for a certain moment, if they are not linked anymore and I reuse them in a while, then I, the, uh, I don't recognize this objectifier to be the same as the one I had in my history. Okay, so this is the PB similarity. It's a little bit of a technical definition. It also preserves certain fragments of UL. So not all UL, only certain fragments. This fragment is called MULP. Okay. There's been a lot of work on, 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 on this stuff. And in particular, um, in, uh, at a certain point, we were able to show that uh, the stability in the case of no quantification across here. Okay? And then we were able to show the desirability in the case of new LP, so using this P by similarity, this restricted version of by similarity over here. However, there was a result essentially obtained at the same time as us in which they were not using this restriction, 
this high dissimilarity, this, uh, this, uh, resti this persistence restrictions on, on the object identifiers, on, uh, on, on the object domain, on, on, the do on the object in the domain. And, uh, uh, and they showed that for a simpler logic, this was desirable. Okay. And then at the same time, we had a very interesting theorem that says, look, if you are working with LTA instead of Bukakulus, then verification is not going to be decided. Okay? This was the example. So there was these two things that looked like conflicting, and for a while we thought that one of us had an error. Okay? Because it, so we know that Bukakulus in the propositional case can subsume both CTL and LTL, but we know that CTL is decidable, in the first order case, and LTL is not decidable in the first order case. So there was something fishy there. Okay, we didn't really know how to do it. And we worked for a long time on this, okay? A long time, I mean uh, four years. Okay. And uh, in the end we got this very interesting result. Actually, for generic transition systems with infinite domains. We have that two transition systems are bisimilar according to the real notion, only if and only if they are bisimilar according to the restricted notion. So what it means? It means that essentially if something is not in the active domain, you are not predicating about it. And so in this kind of transition system, there is nothing interesting that you can say about the things that are not in the active domain. Essentially, this is what this theorem says. Now, with this theorem in array, we had a lot of uh, equivalences and collapsing of uh, notion of equivalence okay, in the values logic and the values by the uh, uh, p by simulation. In particular, we had that uh, um, Mukaku's formula with arbitrary quantification across for generic as your system and also for bundle situation calculus which generate. Uh, is in fact desirable. And uh, this result is actually constructive. So we know exactly how many variable, how many objects we need to have in the active domain used in, in, in this relation. And uh, in particular for the situation calculus, we know exactly how many objects, how many, uh, how many symbolic objects we need to have in the object domain. So what we can do in the situation of is to throw away the real domain and use instead a finite, simpler domain okay, that talks about the same thing symbolically. And essentially we use the same name. Okay, for example, instead of using John, I'm going to use J. And I'm going to use J both for John and uh, James uh, and everybody who has who's, who become who essentially has the same properties as John. Okay, so like say the student that uh, enrolls has all these properties independently of his name essentially. And uh, so there is a, a particular number that we can use, and the number is this one. And the result of this is that we can take this bound the situation action, uh, um, calculus action theory, remove the infinite domain, put the finite domain. When you put the finite domain, it becomes propositional. When it becomes propositional, its transition system becomes finite. And then you use model checking techniques. Okay? And this is an exact procedure. So this is sound and complete. You can always do that. Okay, so it's a very important, uh, interesting result. So we can essentially do using propositional Mukaku model checking. Also, it is a, a very important mathematical consequence. So we now know that new A is decidable, while LTA is undecidable. So what it means in the first order case, Mukakus cannot capture linear time. So while in the propositional case it can, in the first order case it cannot. OK? 
Okay. And uh, I mean, uh, there were hints about the difficulty of doing this uh, in the first order case already, because one of the crucial steps in doing this reduction is to use the automaton for uh, corresponding to the formula, to the, the formula, but this automaton can only be done in proposition. And so there were indications that were saying maybe these two things are not really the same thing, so maybe you cannot do, cannot emulate a TL using well, but now we know that you cannot. That's it. Okay. Okay, in the last part of the talk, I want to go back to more uh, 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 motivational issues. And uh, I want to consider this example. So here, there is a process, okay? So a customer asks to a, a service, okay? To have a certain order, okay? Now, the order in the service is shipped to several factories or providers, okay? Several factory providers. And then the material is assembled and given back to the customer, okay? Now, what is important in this example is that there are many actors around. On the one end there is the customer, on the one end there is our main service, but then there are also the suppliers. So, if we look at the process corresponding to uh, this example, we notice that in fact there are three processes. One is the customer, one is the supplier, and then there is one that is uh, what we are uh, uh, generating, the, the manufacturing, which in turn is separated into sales department, uh, warehouse department, and manufacturing department. Okay, so we have a cross-organization data. And uh, so this is the UML class diagram extremely simplified of, of, of the uh, example. And the point is that this diagram, so the, the various classes in this diagram, the various data in this diagram, are responsibilities of different entities, different actors. Okay? So, we are in a problem of, uh, in a setting where uh, the problem of data integration arises. So we have a global view of several, this is the global view, of several sources. Essentially we have several entities producing data and we have a way of seeing them all in a unified way for the global view. The problem is that we cannot assume that the data okay, in these sources is complete in the, uh, anymore. Why? Because information can be stored maybe in another source, maybe even in a source that is not there at all. So what happens is that the global view actually has to deal with incomplete information. So when we distribute the information around the several sites, the problem of incomplete information becomes essential. We cannot assume complete information anymore. And when this happens, we are actually moving from the simple setting of databases, okay, that is this one, in which you see we have a schema, okay, maybe a set of constraints here, we can call it ontology. Okay, maybe we can even reason on this schema. But when it comes the time to query, we only query the data sources without any form of reasoning. We are just doing query evaluation and produce the result. And this is actually a key to be efficient because the problem of query evaluation is logarithmic in the size of the data. And this is a very important property that makes it feasible in practice to have very large databases. Instead, if we have incomplete information, we are in the so-called knowledge base setting. In this case, we have the schema needs to be used at runtime. So, in this case, the query cannot be posed to the data. It must be posed to the entire schema and all the intentional information might contribute to give the answer, to complete the answer. But this means that you cannot do query evaluation anymore, but you need to do logical inference. You need to do logical inference. 
A logical inference is not efficient. It's typically exponential, hard to leave, even undecidable in the case of the total logic. So if we go from logarithmic to undecidable. Okay? So we need to do something about this. And uh, so in the years, essentially, a formalism, an idea has emerged. It is the idea of using class-based representation. In this class-based representation, for example, UML is a class-based representation, okay, in software engineering. Entity relation diagram used universally in databases, also it's a class-based representation. And in AI, we have very many examples. We have semantic graphs, file system, description logics. And in particular, nowadays, description logic has become somehow the language to express this kind of formalism, or this kind of constraint, this kind of global view, okay, which we call ontology. And in particular, there are standards, standard that uh, correspond to uh, certain description models. Among the value description models, there is one, AutoQL, that is known to have the property of doing logical inference in logarithmic time, like in relational databases, okay, with respect to the data. And this is typically is the logic used for uh, uh, accessing, uh, uh, for solving the data integration problem using Okay, idea. We are a business process. We need to deal with data and uh, process. We know about situation calculus, with very nice properties now. We know about this description logic with this very nice property as well. What about the pre merge them? Okay. We merge them, we are done. Unfortunately, the result is terrible. So it says that even if you consider the simplest kind of description logic and the simplest kind of situation calculus action theory, the simplest kind, you get undecidability. Okay? There's nothing you can do. So essentially, when you compose these two components, you get undecidability. Okay? Even in trivial cases, in the simplest, not trivial, the simplest cases. So, what can we do? Well, what we can do, we can restrict the ontological language. But this is not viable in this application because the ontological language needs to be able to represent the schema of interest, okay? the, 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 the data of interest. So we cannot restrict it because it's needed. So it needs to be somehow a robust restriction. And uh, essentially what's available is not good enough. So there is another way out. And the other way out is to adopt the functional approach to PMBs. Let me tell you about this. This is something that's been done by Hector Levesque, the one that will tell you about the book, in 1984. Uh, 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 the idea is to consider the knowledge base as a data structure, okay, in which you can do two operations, two meta-operations, actually, you can say, you say two operations. One operation is to ask, so you give a query, Okay, you give an ontology, S, okay, and then you compute the answer, the certain answer to this query. And the other one is tell. So you have an action, you have an ontology, and you update, you change the ontology on the base of this action, on the specification of this action. This is the tell. So it is a major advantage. The major advantage is that you are actually separating the reasoning you need to do over a single state through the ontology with the reasoning that you have to do across many states using pretty transition systems. Okay? Because this two becomes two independent theory essentially. This is like more the checking modular theory, we could say. Okay? But also as a, a disadvantage. It confuses what is true or what is known. Notice that these two things are a little bit different. So what is true might be true, but might not be known. <laughs> okay? And instead here, the only thing that you have is what is known. I know this. 
Okay? But I cannot say that. I cannot say that there is something that is true, but I don't know it. I cannot distinguish these two things. Okay? I confuse these two notions. For many applications, it's fine. Okay? Not for all of them, however. Okay, once we do this, however, we, have, we are again ready to play. Because we can take the ontology and the data, we can take the process, and we can combine them together. And uh, um, essentially generate this infinite transition system as before. But uh, the characteristic of this transition system, I'm going to be quick now. Okay, the characteristic of the, so this is the transition system. Okay. So you see, this is the transition, these are the, 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 the data, okay, they are mapped into this ontology, okay, over here. And you see this is like a snapshot. And as I do a transition, I get a new snapshot, and then I get a new snapshot. And when I need to reason over one of these things, okay, I can reason using uh, if this logic, it's a nice logic, for example, how to QA. I can, uh, I can do the reasoning over here, the pre-answer over here in logarithmic time, okay? Logarithmic space, sorry, um, uh, over the data. And when I move, I don't really consider what's available here because I'm going to change it to a new ontology every time that I step. And uh, I think this is too much. Maybe the only thing I want to say is that uh, this uh, new system is indeed generic itself, okay? And being generic, it means that uh, when bounded, and here bounded means that the number of facts that I can add to the database can only uh, have a certain limit. If I want to add new facts, I need to remove all facts. Um, so if I'm state bounded, then I am desirable for the whole campus, even in this case. Okay, I'm done. So, what to bring home? Conceptual model opens. Conceptual model of data and process are important, largely neglected. Okay, but with a steady stream of people of, of research working on on this, and actually major progresses have been. Uh, done in the last years about this, including these desirability results that I just showed you. Now, interestingly, is that these things apply to standard formalism studying, studying also in the AI, okay, in particular situation campus. I didn't say anything about it, but actually, they apply also to Congo and Go Code. It's a program that you run over the situation. Combining the description logic and situation calculus, or more generally, combining the description of ontologies and action is fragile. Okay, what do you mean fragile? On the face of it, it's very difficult. In order to gain some interesting uh, um, manageability of the, uh, and the result of the combination, you need to put place restrictions that are too strong. So essentially, you cannot do it. Okay? But, you can adopt the best functional approach of knowledge bases. And then everything was very smoothly. You can actually apply it. Also, there is an important connection between this idea of the functional approach and updates, up, the notion of updates in uh, studied in, uh, in uh, ontologies and uh, in databases. In fact, I didn't say anything about it, but uh, also, automatic synthesis is possible. Okay, I'm done. Thank you very much. For uh, questions, I have to say that uh, I'm one of those computer scientists who does not know what by simulation is. So I will go look it up right away. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, when you were talking about bounded action theories, you, that, <coughs> when you were talking about bounded action theories, you mentioned fluence. Uh, yeah. Can you mind reminding me what those are? So fluence are properties 
the change as time flows. So, for example, student, okay, you can say John is a student now, okay, but maybe next in graduates he is not a student anymore. Okay, so if you have a property that can change, okay, over time, this is called fluent. Thank you. Um, when you say that uh, you can't combine description lines with description houses, yeah. like Mike Weninger in my class I'm told, they try to do that, yeah. right? So, because I, I work there, so I can't say that. You say it's too fragile because this is scale, it's computation, it's efficient. Um, it's undecidable. It's undecidable so in... Yeah, it's uh, because it's undecidable in an uh, easy case. Okay, right. so very undecidable in easy case. Cases that are a little bit a little bit too easy already. Okay, it's already undecidable. So there is you can have restriction to get decidability. For example, you can say I am only going to change the extension of classes, but not the extensions of relations. Okay, or association in your name. Okay, but what do you do with this? Nothing. So if I have to represent the real, uh, the real data in the domain, I need to be able to change also relations, right? So, so there, there is actually an industry, okay, on getting interesting results for them, but somehow they, what I say, I say that they are too fragile because they cannot be applied in a real situation. They are too ad hoc, okay? Now, with respect to this, there might be surprises, okay, in the in next uh, years, because people are starting looking at that, not from the language perspective, but from the specific form of the ontology perspective, okay? And uh, so this is like a non-uniform complexity, the no difference between the uniform complexity, which is the standard one, and non-uniform complexity, which is where you fix uh, somehow the schema, Okay, in order to, and then there can be surprises. So I know that there are groups that are having interesting results. So maybe you can get something out there. The incremental, so the Lerec approach instead is extremely fast. Extremely. So you can throw at it any kind of a, a knowledge base, okay, and uh, any kind of update. And as long as the result of the update remains of the same shape as the original uh, knowledge base, you can do it uh, many times, and so you can generate transition system out of this. No, but it can be cracked over. No, no. So it's um, um, so the next approach is essentially the approach we have in databases. Okay, so in databases, is what you can do. You can update the database, and what you have essentially you lose track of what the old database was. Okay, so you don't know the old database anymore. You have a new database, and how you get the new database? Very efficient. You actually just adding a new data, but you cannot relate the new database with the old data. Instead, if you do it in a logical theory, you will be able to relate it to the, to, 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 to the past. Okay, so this is lost. You cannot do that in the in, uh, uh, in, in background. I said it is desirable, okay? But how costly? It's X time, okay? Now, X time, when you look at it, X time nowadays is the new polynomial, right? So, X time for us, it's easy, okay? But this X time is actually a very bad X time because it's an X time over the data, okay? So if we are talking about an integrated system, I want to consider a gigabyte of data, you don't want to be exponential in it. But if you refine the analysis, you will see that uh, you are exponential in the things that you allow to change. Okay, so now let me take Amazon. Okay. In Amazon, suppose you want to buy a book. Okay, suppose you want to buy books. 
So can you buy a million books with just one chart? No, you cannot. After a while, the chart becomes full, and you cannot add any more to the chart. Okay, now this bound is big. Maybe I don't know, 32 things, I don't remember. So it's big, but it's there. So what it means? It means essentially that when you do a transaction on the Amazon, you don't really need to consider the entire database of Amazon. You need to consider only these 32 objects. All the rest is irrelevant. Okay? And so what it means? You're going to be exponential in these 32 objects, maybe. Okay? Now things become easier. Okay? Maybe you, don't, you just buy two or three books. Then if you're exponential on two or three books, it's fine. Okay? So what I'm saying is that uh, it's exponential. But it's exponential only on things that are allowed to change. So in order to make it work, you need to be more precise to understand better what you allow to change. Because if something you don't allow to change, keep it separate so that it doesn't mess up the complexity.